Hi everybody, I'm Sherry Grant from New Zealand. I'm here with Samuel Adler in his house in Parisburg, Ohio. Samuel Adler is one of the most prominent and prolific composers today. He has been a pupil of both Hindemith and O'Coplan. Mr. Adler will be celebrating his 95th birthday in March 2023. His music takes him all over the world, although he's mostly based in USA and Germany. Good morning, Mr. Adler. Really? Yeah, it is wonderful to finally meet you after in person, after conversation by email for nearly three years. Um, firstly, I thank you for participating in last year's um, Hindemith and Copeland Online Festival as the festival patron. And I hope in the next festival next year, 20, uh, 2023, we continue to connect with and showcase the composers with um, Hindemith and Copeland heritage. Great. So, um, you were the pupil of Hindemith and Copland. Could you briefly tell us the influence of these composers on your compositional styles? And when you compose, do you come up with the melodies first, or do you work it out in your head and then put it down before putting it down on paper? And do you still write with a pen, or do you use the computer? Even pencil. Even pencil. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's a big question. Mm. Uh, however, I can answer it quite easily because uh, I first studied with a student of Hindemith's uh, from the time I was 13 to the time I went to college. And even after that, his name was Herbert Fromm, uh, who studied with Hindemith both in Europe uh, as well as at Tanglewood and was a very close friend of Hindemith's. So the Hindemith influence came er very early and uh, it made sense to me. So when I studied with him, uh, which was, is always an ordeal because he expects a lot from his students, uh, but uh, I was used to the kind of things that he wanted. And uh, you pretty soon, uh, you sound like a little pow, you know. So uh, my good friend and mentor at Harvard University when I was a graduate student was Irving Fine. And he was a student of Copeland's and a great admirer and also an assistant to Copeland at Tanglewood. <clears throat> and he said, you know, Sam, you have a little more talent than just to sound like somebody else. You need to study with Aaron Copeland. So, uh, he called him, and to make a long story short, at least uh, at first, Copeland did not want me as a student. And uh, it took a couple of phone calls from Irving Fine uh, to say, okay, send him to Tanglewood next summer. He won't like the lessons, but you could send him just the same. And he was right. I went to Tanglewood, and he was really tough on me, which was the best thing that could happen. And I saw, studying his music, that it is it has a lot in common with Hindemith, but it's very different at the same time. Actually, you know, both uh, have music that is based on folk music. Hindemith's Central European, mostly German, and Copeland's, of course, American, and also South American. And I saw what was going on in their music by studying them. And those of us who studied with Copeland and in that particular summer also studied with Messia, uh, saw what these great artists were doing. And we studied their works very intensely. Uh, by the end of the summer, I really was able to be critical about my old work. And he, Copeland said to me, that's the greatest thing that I could have done for you, that is to look at your music, not just say, oh, this is what I want to do, and I don't, but you look at now critically. And that helped me tremendously. Uh, Copeland, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I had wonderful teachers like Piston and, and Hindemith and Herbert Fromm, but Copeland, because he was so intent on making you look at every note, uh, he was the greatest influence at that time. Thank you. As the author of the influential textbook, the 
the study of orchestration. What's your advice for upcoming um, young composers? Uh, how how to improve their writing and uh, how should they develop a sense of structure and then find their own voices? That's actually an easy question yeah. because what they should do mm -hmm. is what we did uh, uh, and what every good composer has done since the beginning of time and that is study the great masterpieces and the great masters music. Mm -hmm. uh, look. Uh, you go back to the greatest composer, I think, and that's Johann Sebastian Bach. He never stopped studying both Italian, French, and even his, of course, his predecessors like Schütz and so on. He never stopped studying them and even transcribing them in order to find out exactly what they were doing. That's how he became such an unbelievably great composer because he got the technique not by going to school but by studying scores that's what young composers have to do all the time mm -hmm. so i was listening to an organ work by your father it was called Medita meditation your father hugo adler it was really great and um, can you tell me a bit uh, can you tell me a bit about your father and um, my father was a words. cantor mm -hmm. and uh, which is a singer, of course, but he also studied, he graduated from the uh, music school in Cologne, Germany, and um, was a student of Ernst Toch. Uh, he was influenced by sacred music of the, of the uh, Jewish faith, uh, as well as sacred music of all faiths. He especially was influenced by Bach, of course, uh, and uh, he wrote a great deal all the time. He, he wrote uh, consistently every day uh, and uh, wrote short organ pieces like that and a lot of sacred music, including large oratorios. Uh, in 1927, he started with an oratorio on Job and uh, an oratorio called Licht und Volk, which means light and people, uh, and then wrote every year one big piece. Uh, when we came to America, uh, he won a prize to set music of the new prayer book of the Reform Synagogue, uh, and from then on kept writing all the time. And we had a very close relationship. He was an excellent pianist. And so I was a violinist, and we played, until I went to college, we played sonatas and other music uh, every day uh, for two hours, every day, from Bach to Bartok. And that was, of course, a tremendous experience for me. And he could read anything at the piano, and that, that was wonderful as far as a young guy is concerned. We had great differences in our outlook on music sometimes. But uh, he was very smart. He didn't always uh, try to change my mind. And he said, okay, if you think that, fine. And then uh, after I graduated from school and after my army period, uh, we were not just father and son, but rather uh, like brothers. He would never publish a piece of his unless I went through it and, and approved of it, which is very unusual for a father-son relationship. I also work with my own daughter and my youngest one, who's um, uh, more like a colleague of mine, even though she's a very young, <laughs> since well, she was good. six, yes. That's good. I asked her to approve of my poems before I sent them oh, as well. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> she's quite the editor. <laughs> That's Zoe. Um, and, and how do you balance your... Uh, conducting and composing careers because I know you're a very good conductor as well and uh, how, how to what do you think how important is it for a composer to also be a very proficient performer I think it's that's a very important thing uh, I, I feel that uh, every composer uh, should have an instrument whether uh, of course I wish I had piano because I mean I play at it I don't play well but at least I play a little. But my, uh, I was a violin major when I went to school. 
uh, and I think it's very important, uh, especially as a violinist, I played in an orchestra, in a professional orchestra, from the time I was 13 years old. And of course, when you hear all these other instruments and get the score and see what makes an orchestra sound like something, that's very important. I feel every composer should uh, be a performer sometime in his life. Of course, when you later on, you don't have time to practice and so on if you're writing music all the time. And as far as conducting is concerned, that has helped me a great deal. Because when you, uh, when you are a conductor, you have to really learn the score inside out. And that is a very important thing uh, for a young composer as well as an old composer. Uh, I was a conductor from the time my father made me conduct his uh, temple choir. And uh, that's even better because it, it does something for your ear, which is uh, just the greatest thing. You know, you have to really listen, especially if they're amateurs, always singing wrong notes. Uh, and it's, it's a very important thing. Uh, my conducting career has stopped, I'm happy to say. I let my wife now conduct. Uh, and, uh, but my early conducting, and I, I was a conductor for many, many years, uh, helped me greatly in organizing my own music and looking at other people's music. Uh, conducting is just like composition, an all-encompassing musical experience. I remember Hindemith as a uh, mostly composer, but also a violist. He was a very good conductor. And conductor as well, oh. but uh, he tried to write for almost all the instruments I, I know in the orchestra. Not try, he did. He did, <laughs> And uh, did, did you make that attempt to write for as oh, yes. many instruments yes. as I, possible? Uh, as he well. wrote sonatas for every instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wasn't that ambitious. I wrote solo pieces for now 24 instruments, wow. uh, 24 different instruments, including even the accordion. Mm -hmm. Now he wrote for very uh, different kinds of instruments, you know, a viola da gamba and viola da bore and so on. I didn't attempt that. I wrote for all the instruments in the orchestra. Uh, early on, I wrote for flute, oboe, clarinet, and bassoon, uh, four pieces, and then, uh, the series started with a trumpet canto uh, all the way to the last one is for bass clarinet. So these are all solo instruments except for one, which is a piece for voice, uh, cello, flute, and three percussionists. Mm. So that's the only non-solo one. How but often the do you solo. set um, um, poems to songs and um, or maybe larger works for choir? What do you mean? Oh, I mean, uh, uh, it's instrumental and there's the choir. Hmm. No, uh, uh, they're purely instrumental. All instrumental, yeah, so. Purely mm. instrumental, except for the fifth. Okay. Which is a poems by a, a, compose, uh, a poet who was the poet laureate at the University of Rochester. Very good poet. And uh, that is actually the most difficult piece in the whole set. Right. Uh, and I took one, the one for clarinet, which is my attempt at klezmer writing. Uh, I did grow up in the klezmer society, uh, but uh, I tried that one and somebody asked me to make a, a version for clarinet and string orchestra, and that has just been recorded beautifully by Charles Nydek, who is one of the great uh, clarinetists of our time. Great. So you served on the faculty at the uh, Eastman School of Music. What's your advice for those um, um, who wish to teach composition at a higher level? My <laughs> first advice is to get a job, <laughs> uh, which is very difficult to mm -hmm. get. Uh, however, uh, the, the most important thing is to value your students not to make them change anything right away. Have them study scores, study with them, go over uh, lots of technical things with them, uh, try to get their ear 
into a whole new pattern of listening. Uh, and actually, I made my students bring scores to uh, their lessons, and we would go over certain things uh, because I think it's important for the a composer to know a great deal of music before saying, oh, well, I don't like this at all. Well, first, know it. Uh, because uh, I think a composer should have a lot of technique. Uh, for instance, I, I always made them uh, do melodic exercises because a lot of uh, kids, uh, you see, I think, I hate to say this, but I really believe it, that today's popular music is not as melodious as the music, the popular music of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, which had nothing but beautiful melody and the harmony going along with it because it was written by real composers. Today all these songwriters really don't know what melody really is, nor do they know anything about harmony. Uh, I mean people like Gershwin or Kern or people like that, that they, those were great harmonists besides melodists. And so uh, I, make, I always had them do for each lesson 10 melodies and then we talked about how this could be harmonized and so on and so forth. I always made them do contrapuntal exercises because I feel that the great composers of the past really grew up on counterpoint and today I'm, unfortunately counterpoint is less taught than harmony and I feel that's a big mistake. Do you also make your students sing? The melody lines? Oh, all the time, oh. all the time. But that comes from Mr. Hindemith. <laughs> he made everybody sing. Uh, actually, it comes from Nadia Boulanger, who made everybody sing their compositions to see, you know, that they really heard them. You know, I mean, you can put down notes, but if you don't hear them, and if you don't hear them in combination with others, then you're really not composing. Um, now a question unrelated to music. I've often been amazed at your energy and what's your secret for maintaining such a sharp mind and uh, actually... So first, the first thing I would say is I'm married to a young woman. So that's the first <laughs> thing that makes... Me, I have to have the energy because otherwise <laughs> I can't keep up with her. But in, in other ways, in other ways, uh, I think it's very important, I mean, I'm very old now, and it's very important that you read a great deal because that keeps the mind going. And you just don't read for fun, but you read for fun, of course, but also to keep your mind sharp. For instance, I know very little about such things as sciences. So I read a great deal about the sciences so that I can relate mm -hmm. because today the science is ruling the roost and also uh, you know get involved politically but not in a down-to-earth way but rather on a higher level and think about things because you have a long life and a long life experience uh, like today uh, we are living in very dangerous times and a lot of people don't even think about that. I mean, after all, uh, I don't see how we can have wars. That is beyond my thinking, because after all, we have developed something so horrible that it could destroy all of us. And we have to remember that. Yes. Uh, and this is a very important thing. Uh, because you see, uh, I've read your questions and so I'm going to answer the last question with this one uh, because it's a very important one. I really feel that music, art, poetry, literature, all these things can help us make a better life but it can't change our politics. It never had any influence and it can't now. We have to do what we can but there is no way that we can interfere with people who really don't know what it's about. Uh, music and art can only 
enliven and uh, get life uh, to a more beautiful and the more important part of our being, but it cannot change politics. Yeah, I understand that. Thank you very much, Samuel. And I look forward to your 95th birthday celebration. And I hope there'll be I a do too. concert uh, and, and the recording so we can all enjoy it. Yeah, and I feel really privileged to know you. And I hope to bring more of your music back to New Zealand. And um, yeah, I hope to establish this cultural exchange. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much.